All right, so this is the second of our videos on limits involving infinity uh, for Math 1560 Calc 1 at the UofL for Fall 2017. Uh, and uh, so in the last video, we looked at infinite limits, situations where the y values were growing without bound, uh, basically uh, which graphically correspond to functions with vertical asymptotes in their graph. Uh, today we're going to look at, or in this video, we're going to look at uh, limits at infinity, meaning we're going to consider what happens as x goes to infinity rather than as y goes to infinity. Okay, So here's a definition. Uh, we've put one definition up on the screen and you can make similar definitions for all the variations that you can make here with the different signs. Um, so you want to say that the limit of a function has a certain value L as x goes to infinity. So what does that mean? Well, that means, as usual, if we, if we say that f of x is approaching some limiting value L, that means that we can make the values of f of x, we can make the y values as close to L as we want. Um, and in, in this case, how do we make f of x close to L? Well, we want x to go off towards infinity. And what does that mean? We can't actually set x equal to infinity. Infinity is not a number. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we just consider arbitrarily large values of x. So the idea is that you, however close you want to make the function to L, right? if we have this limit, you can make the function as close to L as you want if you take a large enough value for x. Okay? And you can consider, of course, you can consider x going not only to positive infinity, but also off to negative infinity. You can consider large but negative values. And you can also consider infinite limits at infinity, uh, negative infinite limits at infinity. All right, so these um, cases where both x and y are going to infinity, these are typical of a lot of graphs, for example, polynomial graphs. Um, exponential functions. There's lots of functions where as x goes to infinity, y also goes to infinity. We see plenty of examples like this. Um, the ones that are going to be more interesting are going to be these ones like we see here where you have a finite limit as x goes to infinity. So we're going to be looking for examples that behave like that. All right. Here are a couple of examples with finite limits. One where x is going to infinity, one where x is going to minus infinity. Um, so let's think about this first limit. Um, we've got 1 over x, x is going to infinity. So what do we think the limit should be? Well, we're taking 1, so 1 is a constant value, 1 is not changing, and we're dividing by this variable x. And the values of that variable are getting larger and larger and larger and larger, right? So if I have one thing and I divide it among two people, they each get half, I divide it among three, they get a third, then a quarter, then a fifth, right? So the the, the portion that you get as x gets larger and larger, the portion you get gets smaller and smaller. And, you know, if you were dividing among a million people, you're getting a pretty tiny piece, and as x gets bigger and bigger, well, 1 over x is getting closer and closer to 0, so we expect that that value should be 0. And and this limit, by the way, um, is, is something you can just take as a given when you're exploring other limits where x goes to infinity. So the same is going to be true if you consider limits for any positive power of x. So if I'm considering the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x to the n, where n is a positive integer, so n is 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, or even fractional powers, really n could be any real number here bigger than 1, um, bigger than or equal to 1, this is going to work. Okay, uh, in fact, bigger than zero will do the job. Uh, and again, if you want to, if you want to kind of think about how you would you would make a formal argument here, we don't really do formal limit proofs in this course, but how would you make sense of this? Well, I mean, informally, I guess we could make sense of it graphically if we think about the graph y equals one over x for positive x values. You get something like this, and you see this this horizontal asymptote. We'll talk about those in a bit, right? The y values are getting closer and closer to zero. Uh, the other way you could do it is you could think about choosing some tiny value and figuring out how can you choose x big enough um, so that you get a um, a value for one over x that's smaller than that tiny value, um, right? And well, I mean, essentially, you just do one over that tiny value. That's going to give you a big x value, and and you've got it. Okay, now the second one, we've got an exponential function, and of course we're used to thinking of the exponential function as something that grows really, really, really big, uh, but well, that's only really true if you're considering large positive values of x, right? The graph, the graph looks something like this, okay, and 
if we're considering values of x going off towards minus infinity, that means we're heading that way, right? Then the graph of e to the x gets closer and closer and closer to zero, right? Um, and, and one way to think about it is if you think about, um, you can think about it this way: if um, if x is equal to minus a, where a is a positive number, so that x is negative, right? Then um, e to the x is e to the minus a and laws of exponents say if you've got a negative exponent that tells you to take a reciprocal so that's 1 over e to the a and then using the same sort of argument as in in the first example right um, as a gets big e to the a gets really big and 1 over a really big number is a really small number and so once again we expect that this limit will be zero um, We'll see examples where the limit is not zero, but there are lots of simple examples where that is, uh, it's a very common limit at infinity. Okay, moving right along, and oh, we've got software issues again, let me pause. Okay, back in business. Um, so whenever we have a finite limit at infinity, we have what's called a, a horizontal asymptote. So as x goes to either plus infinity or minus infinity, if we get a finite value, in this case I've called it b, if we get a value b for that limit, well then we would say that you've got a horizontal asymptote. Okay? So, so a horizontal asymptote is just a, a horizontal line, it's a constant y value that your graph approaches as x goes off to either infinity or minus infinity. Um, and unlike vertical asymptotes, there's no reason why the graph of a function cannot cross a horizontal asymptote, right? With, um, with vertical asymptotes, you run into the problem that if you go across, you know, if you cross a vertical line, but you're still trying to approach that vertical line, well, that means you've got to go across, and then you've got to come back, and there's no way to do that without having a function that's multiply valued, right? You're going to have more than one um, y value associated to a given x value. Uh, but for a horizontal you know, asymptote, we can have many x values associated to a given y value. That way around, everything is fine. And so here's, here's an example, sine x over x. If you graph this thing, what you find is you get something that kind of goes like this. It looks like a sine function, but it the oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and it peters out. And it does the same thing in either direction, right? And and so there you do have um, a horizontal asymptote because if you calculate the limit as x goes to infinity or minus infinity, if you calculate the limit of this function as x goes to infinity again, you find that the limit is zero, and so you have a horizontal asymptote there. Um, Okay, so as as so the only the only requirement here is that if you go far enough out along the x-axis, the y values get closer and closer to zero. So even though it keeps bouncing back and forth across the the x-axis, it keeps going above, then below, and then above, and then below. Those oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually settle down and get really close to zero. Um, now the arctangent function, we showed you that graph. Um, in, in a previous video, and I think I still have it here. Let me show you the graph. Okay, let me make that bigger. There it is. Um, so remember that the way we construct this arctangent function is we start with we start with the graph of of the tangent function, but the tangent function is not one to one, so we can't really define an inverse at first. But if we just choose one of these pieces, so we choose this one in the middle here. Okay. So that is the tangent function for x going from minus pi over 2 to plus pi over 2. And you notice that uh, the y values go from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? The tangent function has a couple of vertical asymptotes. So when you take the inverse, right, whenever you take the inverse of a function, you're sort of exchanging the roles of x and y. So vertical asymptotes are going to become horizontal asymptotes, right? The domain becomes the range. The range becomes the domain. We switch everything around. And, well, here's the arctangent function, okay? Right? So again, we see this, this general principle that when you take the inverse, you reflect the original graph across this line, uh, y equals x. And there are a couple of horizontal asymptotes. What's interesting here is this is an example of a graph that actually has two horizontal asymptotes. Uh, one of them 
let me see if I can if I can put it in. One of them is going to be when y equals pi um, over two. Uh, oops, I said one, didn't I? Hit there. We go. Um, okay, and the other one is when y equals minus pi over two. I think I might have. Uh, oh. I missed the uh, I missed the divide sign there. Well, we can see the first one. Oh, let's put it in. Let's put it in. Uh, okay, divides. There we go. So you can see the two horizontal asymptotes. Right as we go off towards plus infinity, the y values are getting really close to pi over two. As we go off towards minus infinity, the y values get really close to minus pi over two. And so we have, if we wanted to write that out, we have that the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x equals pi over 2 and the limit as x goes to infinity, oops, sorry, to uh, minus infinity g of x equals minus pi over 2. Okay, so I think that's an interesting example because most of the examples that you see tend to be ones where there's only one horizontal asymptote. And one of the most common examples that we see where there is always only one horizontal asymptote is the case of rational functions. So we're going to end with that. Uh, so as a reminder, a rational function is any function where you've got one polynomial divided by another. And remember that in a polynomial function, all that you have in a polynomial function are powers of x possibly multiplied by real number coefficients. So all of these a's and b's that you see are just numbers, and then we have powers of x, right? So that's what a general rational function looks like, right? Um, we know if we, if we were going to try to graph a rational function, there's lots of things that you look for. One of the things you can do is you can figure out where the denominator is zero. That tells you the location of vertical asymptotes. How do you find horizontal asymptotes? Well, it turns out there are three cases. Um, the first case, is when m is bigger than n. And what you can do in that case is we're going to take everything that we see and we're going to divide. And, and by the way, you don't have to go through these steps every time. Once you sort of understand what the three cases are, you can just, you know, as soon as you analyze it, you can tell me what the answer is. But if m is bigger than n, what we do is we divide we divide everything by x to the m. So we do that top and and bottom. And and what do we get? We if so if you divide divide everything by x to the m, okay, then we get something that looks like this. So when I divide x to the n by x to the m, right, we, we subtract exponents, so I get n minus m right down to a one and x uh, to the 1 minus m and a naught x to the minus m and we divide by well this bm this coefficient bm is just left by itself x to the m divided by x to the m they cancel out just leave me with bm right and and then and then the next let me just put the next term in so the next one would be m minus 1 x to the minus 1, and so on down to b1, x to the 1, minus m, and b0, x to the minus m. Okay, and, and now we go back and, and remember that we consider this situation here that really 1 over any positive power of x, we know that's going to go to 0. And so if we look at what we have here, um, all of these exponents are negative because m is bigger than n. So all these are negative exponents, meaning that these are really reciprocal powers of x, right? So this is 1 over x to the n minus m, 1 over x to the m minus 1. Uh, right? all, all of these are, are going to be reciprocals, so they're, it's 1 over some positive power of x. And so when we take the, the limit, right, so as x goes to infinity, that's going to go to zero, right? All of them are going to go to zero. Zero. This goes to zero. This goes to zero, right? Everything goes to zero except for that guy. And and so when you take the limit, what do you get? Well, you get that the limit 
as x goes to infinity of f of x, well, you just get 0 over bm, which is just, well, 0. So anytime the power is bigger on the bottom, the limit at infinity is always 0. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because larger powers of x grow faster than smaller powers of x. And so as, as x goes to infinity, really, when you're considering large values of x, the only thing that really matters are these leading terms, right? You can forget about all the lower powers of x, right? For small values of x, sure, they're relevant. But for, for as x goes to infinity, they don't really matter anymore. Think about even, you know, like a cubic, let's say, right? So, you know, you compare x cubed to x squared, right? Let's say x is a billion. Well, a billion squared seems like a really huge number, but it's nothing compared to a billion cubed, right? And, and so you only really need to look at these highest powers. And so, really, if you just kind of analyze this highest power, what you have is you've got a to the n over b to the m, time, so if we forget about everything else, we've got we've got something that looks like that. Um, and, and so if you think about it that way, you can analyze these cases, right, and we can see that, okay, in the case that we're considering, m is bigger than n, then this is a negative exponent, so we can put that in the denominator, and as x goes to infinity, it's going to go to zero, as we've seen. Um, what about if m, if m equals n, if m equals n, let me put that in here, what happens when m equals n? Well, let's think about it. If m equals n, then this exponent would just be 0. And so that's not x to the 0 is just 1, right? And, and so what are we left with? If, if we're considering x going to infinity, if we could ignore all the lower order stuff, all we're really left with is a n over b m. And so that's, that's what our limit is. Our limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is simply this ratio, a n over bm. Okay. And similarly if um if m is um smaller, if m is smaller, so if the de degree of the denominator is higher, well in that case, in that case the power on top is going to win and the whole thing is going to go to infinity. Okay. Um so that's it for this video. We've got one more a topic to cover on, on the limits chapter, which is continuity, and we'll do that in some later videos.